In this project, we've been uh, trying to find things that can be measured on young, healthy pigs that are good genetic indicators of their progeny being more resilient when they got, get, get out to the field. Uh, and we've done a lot of uh, 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 different assays. The one that we're looking at now is looking at stress hormones in hair. Um, as your hair grows, well, we all know that if we get stressed, whether it's uh, you know, just stress from work or, 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 or also disease, um, our stress hormones response systems, they, 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 um, they get invoked. Uh, and we get an increase in stress hormones like cortisol, cortisone, and some others. Well, as you have higher levels of those hormones in your blood, um, some of that gets deposited in, incorporated in your hair as it grows. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host of the podcast. Joining me this week in our illustrious podcast studios is Dr. Jack Deckers. Dr. Deckers is a distinguished professor at the Iowa State University. Jack, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. If you would, why don't you start with a little introduction for the audience? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yes, I'm uh, Jack Deckers. I uh, Hearing from my accent, I grew up in the Netherlands um, and uh, studied there and then went for my PhD to the uh, University of Wisconsin. Worked primarily on dairy cattle, breeding and genetics, uh, but then um, over 25 years ago, I had the opportunity to move to Iowa State University, which is sort of the founding the, the founders of uh, animal breeding and genetics, and, and then switched to working on pigs, genetics of pigs, and also uh, some on, on poultry. Jack, the uh, genetics industry has put a lot of emphasis on uh, disease here in recent years, and uh, you've had the, the privilege to work on a project with uh, Pig Gen Canada, as I understand it, on disease resilience in grow-finished pigs. You want to talk to us a little bit about that project? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah, so Pig Gen Canada is a, a consortium, a research consortium of seven breeding companies that are uh, operational in North America, and uh, so they got together and then... And, and, um, us as researchers from uh, Iowa State, from uh, University of Alberta, Mike Dick and Graham Plastow and uh, John Harding from uh, University of Saskatchewan and others, we, we got involved and uh, have, have had this project on uh, disease resilience in, in grow finished pigs. And the idea is that, of course, disease resilience is very important. And, and when I talk about disease resilience, it's the ability of a pig to um, not necessarily prevent getting infected, but if the pig gets infected, it's able to cope with it well and recover and then keep on growing. Um, now we've heard a lot about uh, the disease-resistant PERS pig uh, using gene editing. Knocking one gene out makes pigs completely resist resistance to PERS. It's unlikely we're going to be able to do that for all the diseases that are out there. And um, especially if you consider that, you know, Viruses and bacteria, they evolve. We get new diseases. Absolutely. So our yeah. focus has been on disease resilience. So can't prevent a pig getting protected from all pathogens. Um, so um, have breed pigs that are more resilient, that are better able to cope with those pathogens. And, uh, of course, that's very important for breeding companies because they um, their breeding programs have to be in very high biosecure herds, nucleus herds. Um, and so they have a very hard time selecting for disease resilience because their animals, their selection candidates, they, get, they don't get exposed to disease. And so um, uh, in this project, we've been uh, trying to find things that can be measured on young, healthy pigs that are good genetic indicators of their progeny being more resilient when they got, get, get out to the field. Uh, and we've done a lot of uh, 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 different assays. The one that we're looking at now is looking at stress hormones in hair. Um, as your hair grows, well, we all know that if we get stressed, whether it's uh, you know, just stress from work or, 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 or also disease, um, our stress hormones response systems, they, 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 um, they get invoked. Uh, and we get an increase in stress hormones like cortisol, cortisone, and some others. 
Well, as you have higher levels of those hormones in your blood, um, some of that gets deposited in, incorporated in your hair as it grows. So if you have a person that has very long hair, you can look at the ends of the hair and evaluate their response to stresses that they were exposed to when that hair was grown. Okay, and so if you have a person with very long hair, you can sort of look at the different uh, different portions of the hair, and it's like looking at rings on a tree. Now, we didn't do that in pigs. We actually shaved the hair when they were about 40 days of age, uh, and at that time, they were still healthy. They were in, in, in uh, clean multiplier farms. They were uh, Yorkshire land-raised barrows clean her multiplier farm, but they were exposed to a lot of non-infectious stressors. You know, they were weaned, they were transported to a research station in Quebec, Canada. Uh, they were mixed, new diet, lots of things going on. And so we cut the hair and measured stress hormones. Um, and then they went into a disease challenge, the, a barn that was seeded with multiple diseases, um, including PERS, flu, number of bacterial diseases, uh, and and um, so, you know, everything, I wouldn't say everything on the sun, but a lot of major pathogens that are out there in the field were uh, present in that, in, in that uh, research barn. And then we measured mortality, treatments, also feed intake, growth rate, um, actually water intake also, um, and carcass traits, which allowed us to measure, you know, which pigs are more or less resilient to, to these, this multitude of pathogens. And then we cut the hair again when once they that same patch of hair, that the regrowth, we measured it again when they were about 40 days into the disease challenge. So then they are primarily exposed to infectious stressors and uh, stress hormones we see in hair reflect infectious stressors rather than non-infectious stressors. Well, then if we looked at the level of, of, of cortisol, for example, in hair, in those two hair samples, both of them were quite heritable, meaning that uh, about 25% of the differences between pigs that we saw in the level of uh, cortisol in hair was due to genetics, which means we can select for it, right? Now, we would only select for that if, you know, if it's important, right, for the biology or disease resilience in this case. And we did find that there were relationships. So that pigs that had lower levels of uh, uh, cortisol in their hair, they tended to be genetically, they tended to be more, more resilient. And so that's, uh, uh, there's, there's more validation that is needed. You know, you, you know, we're not able to work with huge numbers of animals that we need to estimate these genetic parameters uh, accurately, but uh, it, it does indicate that there are some very promising tools there that breeding companies can use to select within their nucleus herds. Very interesting. Um, Jack, do you know uh, for the individual pig, um, is there any correlation between their, their stress response capabilities differentiated between environmental stressors? You know, you mentioned weaning, nutrition, certainly, uh, you know, environment, the temperature, the humidity versus disease stress response. Said another way, if I'm a pig and I'm good at managing the disease stress, am I also good at managing the environmental stress or those two things are totally independent? That's a very good question. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why we set up collecting those two samples, the one hair, hair sample collected when they're primarily exposed to uh, uh, non-infectious stressors, environmental stress, and then the one later uh, infectious stressors. And when we look at cortisol levels, they're fairly highly correlated uh, genetically, so that the genes that affect cortisol level in, uh, in the one sample were fairly similar to the one in the other sample. No, you know, correlation was about 0.6, so not huge, but but uh, so but it also indicated that there are differences, right? And what we found is that um, a lot of the genes that affect the cortisol, the additional genes that affect cortisol level uh, uh, to uh, infectious stressors, were related to the immune system. So so this the this response to uh, an environmental stress and an infectious stress. Some of the same genes are 
involved in responding to that, but there are also differences. And, and it's well known that response to non-infectious stressors also triggers the immune system. You know, if, if we get stressed, we're more susceptible to get sick, right? So it, it weakens the, the immune system because a lot of energy goes towards uh, the stress response. So, so yeah, they are definitely definitely co co connected. There's actually one gene. So one of the things that we did in these pigs also, they were genotyped for um, 600,000 uh, positions across the genome, which we can now do with genomics. And then we were able to look at, well, which genes affect stress response. And we found one gene that explains about almost 40% of the genetic variation in differences, genetic differences in uh, cortisol levels at both in both hair samples. And it's a gene that is, uh, well, it, it, it's close to or in the what's called the, the glucocorticoid receptor gene, which is the receptor that binds, that cortisol binds to. So that makes a lot of sense. And so um, that's one we're looking into further. You know, should we select for that? Because you know, there's, it's, it's a very complex system. So the other thing we have to do in, in addition to validating, we have to make sure that we're not um, hurting anything else that is important. Will, uh, will it be possible to publish that gene so that uh, if you're a, a breeding stock herd anywhere in the world, you could say, OK, let's go do some molecular evaluation of our population and see where we stand relative to other other populations of purebred pigs? Yeah, that's that's uh, actually we, we just yesterday got a paper accepted in uh, genetics that publishes that gene. And so one of the things that is quite unique about uh, PigGen Canada and this research consortium, you know, they're competitors, they're fierce competitors with each other, right? But they, they decided, you know, this is an important enough problem and, a, and a, a big enough problem that we can solve it on our own. So let's get together and get funding from um, actually the federal, uh, federal government in Canada and the U.S., uh, grants, we, we are able to uh, get this research going and let's publish it. You know, because it's important enough that, you know, we shouldn't keep it to ourselves. You know, we need to we need to help the industry. And that's that's been our goal with this project is, uh, yeah, we're not putting patents on anything. Uh, it's all publicly available. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Well, and I applaud you and the, the Pig Gen Canada group for doing that. And I understand the competition. But at the end of the day, raising healthy pigs is fun. You know, um, for our caretakers, uh, we owe it to them to try and put them in an environment that is that they enjoy their work. And for the pig, right? I mean, if we can help the animal well-being of the pig, it's, it's a no-brainer to do it. We should work together as an industry to do so. We should also tell our consumers that story. We should explain to our consumers, hey, look what we are doing collectively, right? In spite of the competitive nature of this, we are going to improve the well-being of our pigs through this effort, um, regardless of what it means for each of our individual businesses. So Jack, I applaud you for doing that. And I applaud the Pig Gen Canada group for having the willingness to lead on that effort. Yeah. And it's been a great collaboration with the industry, with, uh, you know, people like Mike Dick at the uh, University of Alberta, John Harding and, and others. Uh, you know, a lot of the essays of hair were done at the University of Saskatchewan by Yolande Seddon, who is a, a faculty member there. And so it's been a great collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it's been uh, great to be a part of. But I know it's an ongoing project, Jack, so please come back in the near future and keep us posted. And anybody else in the group that, uh, that you'd like to, to kind of push our direction, we welcome them coming on for a future episode. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Well, thanks for being here, Jack, and thanks to our audience for listening in. Um, we certainly couldn't do this without the audience, so uh, appreciate you being a part of this. If you haven't checked out our website, please go to swinehealthblackbelt.com and do so. Uh, we've got quite a back catalog of excellent episodes just like this one that you should check out. For Dr. Jack Deckers, my name's Dr. Clayton Johnson. It's been a pleasure to spend some time with you today. Please have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Hey, everybody. 
We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health-related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at W-I-S-E-N-E-T-I-X dot com.